Hey, welcome to Earth 2050. You're living in a world after the great temperature shift of 2020. Days are as hot as they can be, and nights are just as cold. Humans have always depended on the environment, but now they're more vulnerable than ever. Fuel, money, precious metals all lost their value in a world where ice costs more than gold during the day. And you can exchange a brand new designer watch for an electric blanket at night. You don't remember the world that used to be, because you were born in the new climatic era. You were lucky to find a good job right after college. The company you work for sells bottled water. When it's 100 degrees plus outside during the day, bottled water is on top of world sales. The antiperspirant business is booming too. People can easily go through two sticks a week. You wake up at 6.30 when it's still cold. The sun comes up in half an hour, and the shift will follow shortly after. There's a half-hour window between 7 and 7.30 when temperatures are pretty moderate, like spring in the old times. Most of the day, from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., is like living in an oven. 7.30 to 8 p.m., it's probably like what they used to call autumn. From then on, it's 40 below. Today's a big day. Mm. Could mean your first promotion. You take a deep breath. Slide your feet into your slippers and head to the shower. On autopilot of the day-to-day routine, you first turn the sink faucet all the way off. It's an old-world habit your parents recommended to keep the pipes from freezing. Even though all of yours are up to code, wrapped in heating tape and insulated, you'd rather not risk it. You get dressed, the daily shorts, sandals, and tank top. They have high-tech thermo clothes that adjust for the day and night temperatures. But you don't have the money for those. Maybe if you get that promotion, you can invest in a good, efficient wardrobe. Funny thing is, you can always tell a person's status by looking at them. Some things never change. The thermos walk confidently with their stylish tech wear. You and the rest of the baggers pack extra clothes for work in cold evenings. Got your umbrella? Doesn't help with the heat, but at least the sun doesn't beat directly down on you. Shades, deodorant, SPF, day supplies are good. Now for evening. Gloves? Check. Winter co- Ding! You get a text message. It's your boss. You're coming in a little earlier today to set up for the presentation, right? You text her back and head to the kitchen for breakfast. Coffee's a luxury. Same goes for fruits and veggies. Unless you grow them at home, but your personal greenhouse is pretty modest. Tomatoes, corn, some melons, and lettuce. The greenhouse is still cold and heat-resistant like the standard model, but you definitely need to upgrade to a bigger one. Eh, no time, too much work. You grab an apple, a bottle of water, your bag, and rush out the door. You usually leave at a quarter past seven. It's a 15-minute walk to the office, just enough to beat the heat. But you're out shortly after sunrise today. There are thousands of people on the street. Everyone tries to stay indoors unless it's during those 30-minute pockets of moderate weather. Even with the crowd traffic, you still get to the office just in time to set up for the big presentation. You majored in water manufacturing and distribution. When you told your boss about this idea of yours, she immediately invited the bigwigs to hear you out. It could cut the price of bottled water in half and put the company in the history books. You hurry to the locker room to change into your suit. The presentation goes great, despite your nervousness. Your boss tells you big things are coming your way. But take a vacation, because you'll need plenty of rest before work begins on turning your idea into a reality. You go online to see your options. People don't vacation to the beach anymore, because the climate is pretty much the same everywhere. That, and you can't fly anywhere. Air travel is a thing of the past, since planes can't take off in 100-degree weather. High heat means air is thinner, so the wings can't produce lift. At least, that's what your granddad told you. He was a pilot in the times before the shift. Skiing, ice skating, and snowboarding are now done only at indoor artificial snow resorts. Now that sounds refreshing. You finish work at 4 p.m. You think about going straight home, but you're in such a good mood you decide to go for a stroll in the park. Gotta change back into your shorts and tank first. You walk along the empty streets. Hardly anyone just hoofs around in the heat of the day. Whew, you immediately understand why. You look at the city. 
Short groundscapers line the streets. Skyscrapers are no more. The huge temperature fluctuation between day and night made them unstable and wore them down. Plus, skyscrapers trap heat and make the city hotter, something nobody needs in this new age. You look at the rooftops, covered in solar panels. Everything runs on sun power. Cars, public transport, central heating and cooling. The sun may feel like your worst enemy during the day, but at least it helps keep you warm inside at night. The park looks nice from afar. Trees, bushes, green grass, and flowers. But everybody knows they aren't real. Unless plants are in a greenhouse, they're artificial. The daytime heat would scorch and dry them up. The blistering cold would freeze them overnight. You sit down on a bench and hear two old men talking about how different the world is today. The landscape changed so much. Ponds and lakes evaporated entirely within a few months. They reminisce about fishing trips, farms, and fields. Yeah, only desert animals made it through the shift. You can see coyotes, roadrunners, lizards, and scorpions if you head far enough out of the city. Camels have replaced cows and horses on every continent. 30 years of the new climatic era aren't enough for evolution to make any big changes. But people have already started to look different, too. Skin is getting thicker and rougher to deal with the temperature fluctuations. Eyebrows are bushier to keep the sweat on your forehead from rolling down into the eyes. One of the old men looks at his watch. Half past seven. We got a skedaddle, Jim. It's 7.30 already? You've already wandered far from your house. You open your bag and dig for your pants, gloves, boots, and… Where's your winter coat? You keep digging. Panic rises in your chest. You start throwing things out of your bag, desperately hoping it's buried at the bottom. No such luck. You get a chill down your spine. Fear? Yes. But also because it's already cooling down. You throw all your stuff back in the bag and start sprinting down the street. 740. You're not going to make it. At least the running is keeping you pretty warm. 750. There are no buses, no cars, no nothing. Everybody's already inside. 755. You know what's coming if you don't get home by 8. When it's minus 40 degrees and you're in your daytime clothes, it takes just 5 minutes for hypothermia to set in. You've heard the horror stories. People venturing out into the cold without the right gear on. First, the shivering, rapid heartbeat. Your body fights to keep you warm. Then the shivering stops. Heart rate goes down. You start to feel lightheaded. Your body gives up. When they pass out, that's it. 7.58. You see your street up ahead. Come on, legs, go faster! 8 p.m. The cold knocks the wind out of you. You're a minute from your house. Just keep going. The air stings your lungs. Your eyelashes get covered in ice. Your nose is bright red. Is this it? This is how you go? 8.01. You burst through your front door and fall to the floor. Made it. You open your eyes, and the first thing you see is your winter coat hanging on the back of your desk chair. You can't help but burst out in laughter at your carelessness. This day that started out so perfectly, yet turned so quickly, like day and night. (sighs) I really do need that vacation. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, The cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass, and the trees. And ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky, and their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky. And the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. It's neither too close nor too far from the sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus, the second planet from the Sun, our Earth's evil twin. 
because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too, either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the Sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. 
The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the sun, and even the presence of the moon in its skies. All of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation, like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay? You're driving to your sister's house when all of a sudden the sky changes. The cool weather becomes scorching hot in a matter of minutes. People who were going for casual autumn strolls have now taken off their jackets and are sweating. People who were planning on going for a weekend ski trip have canceled their plans at the last minute to head to the beach. It was sunset, but the sky has become as bright as day. You fish out your sunglasses and continue driving. Nothing seems normal, but people don't seem to care. You put on the radio and hear everyone panicking about the sun. Nothing is cohesive. They're jumbling up their words and saying a gazillion things at the same time. You take out your phone and see what's happening on social media. And it's all the same thing. Nothing is comprehensible. It's just people talking about how the sun is getting closer to the earth. Footsteps are clacking along a quiet hallway. A man dressed in a sharp suit is making his way to one of the most important meetings of his life. Adam walks through the meeting room while everyone is waiting to hear what he has to say. As the head astrophysicist, it's Adam's responsibility to figure out what is happening and not let the public know what's going on. Otherwise, the whole world will succumb to panic and mass hysteria, which won't be good. He takes a seat at the head of the table while everyone waits for what he has to say. The room is tense, and no one is saying a word. He takes off his glasses and places them on the table. Everyone is watching his every move. He takes a few files out of his folder and starts reading. His voice can command a room. My fellow colleagues, I'm afraid the worst has fallen on us. After countless hours of consistent observation and analysis, we have discovered that a piece of the sun has abandoned its orbit and it's making its way toward us. We still don't know which part of the sun, but we know that once it strikes us, we may not have an Earth to call home any longer. The tension in the room is palpable. Everyone looks at each other confused. Adam answers as many questions as he can, but he himself doesn't even have some of the answers. In a matter of minutes, the press leaks some voice recording of Adam's speech, and the world goes berserk. Back to you.
You just heard a snippet from Adam's speech and aren't too convinced of its validity. Even though the sky is getting brighter by the second, there's still no reason to panic. You continue driving, and suddenly you sense an intense vibration. Your car lifts off the ground and the windows shatter. You get out and duck for cover. You saw a comet-like object strike down in the middle of nowhere, miles away. More of these objects look like they're heading toward the ground. You start your car and drive off, trying to find a place to hide. Ashes start covering the sky, which makes it even hotter than it already is. The earth is scorching. Meanwhile, traffic is piling up for people who want to escape but don't have any real place to hide. You eventually abandon your car and go on foot trying to find a place to cool down and get away from the sun's rays. Even though ash is covering the sky, the sun is still blasting through it. You head to the woods and find a cave to cool down in. It's still hot, but at least you can calm down and figure out your next move from there. You get out your phone and try to see if there's any news updates on what's happening. But nothing seems to be updated. You keep refreshing it, but nothing works. Suddenly, you hear some people getting closer, and they order you to step outside of the cave. Adam is with the top scientists in the world, trying to figure out a solution. Everyone is presenting him with solutions, but in the end, none of them are achievable. They've spent hours in the office, but with each passing minute, the sun is getting stronger and the sky is getting brighter. It feels like nothing can be done until Adam has an aha moment. He calls for everyone's attention and asks for the extra people who are not contributing to leave the room. He mentions that they need to launch a rocket into space that can divert the large mass heading toward the Earth before it breaches the atmosphere. They only have a few hours before the sky becomes completely dangerous and unsuitable for flying. As for now, all flights around the world have been canceled. There is only a small window of opportunity to get this rocket out there and save the world. Adam summons the best engineers he can find to adjust the rocket and the astronauts who will volunteer for the mission. They go into quick basic training and start planning for the next steps. After many briefings, they're ready, but they only have one shot at diverting the large object. The astronauts are ready and begin to enter the rocket. Suddenly, you pop up out of nowhere, dressed in a spacesuit. You're one of the prominent astronauts for the mission. Those people who found you in the cave were from NASA, trying to recruit you for the mission. You meet with Adam, and he quickly briefs you about your role. Because the mission is very last minute, there wasn't even time for Adam to sit with you and give you the proper training or brief. You enter the rocket and take your seat. The engineers and scientists gather around to make sure that everything is in order before takeoff. The large object is getting closer, and if the rocket is delayed, then it'll melt when it reaches the final part of the mission. You're strapped in, and the rocket starts rattling. All systems are in order. Three, two, one, blast off. The rocket picks up and shoots into the sky. There are extra layers of visor shield protection since it feels like you're getting closer to the sun. After a few minutes, the rocket leaves the Earth's atmosphere and is at the forefront of the large object. The rocket suspends itself in a certain strategic position, waiting for the right time to swat the object out of the Earth's trajectory. Meanwhile, everyone back on Earth is hiding in bunkers when the loose debris strikes. A cleanup team will be ready to get rid of the space rocks that will be scorching hot. The bunkers are equipped with food, water, and electricity in case they have to remain underground for a while. Only a few minutes left until the moment comes. You press a button and get ready to deploy a large spike that's as long as the Statue of Liberty. The spike is kept on a stand that's attached to the rocket. It will fire the spike like a bow and arrow and shoot it straight through the large object, breaking it before it melts. There's less than one minute before impact. The arrow is stretched and released. The tip of the arrow has a titanium drill that will continue drilling through the object as soon as it hits. The arrow is released and shoots through space, breaking little pieces of space objects along the way. As it speeds through, it finally hits the large object and drills through it. But nothing seems to be happening. The drill is barely getting through the center. Luckily, Adam had already thought of a backup plan. 
The rocket, still suspended in its spot, fires a laser where the spike is to speed things up. The laser starts melting through to get to the core. The object is getting closer and is speeding up. The object still hasn't broken into pieces yet. Less than two minutes until impact and everyone is running out of options. Adam has one last trick up his sleeve. He orders everyone to evacuate the rocket and move to the backup pods. He wants to put the rocket on a straight collision course with the large object. There's too much confusion. Everyone, including you, quickly heads to the pods and ejects to a safe distance. These pods won't float around in space since they have pressurized air that allows the pods to move in whatever direction the driver wants. Everyone shoots out of the rocket while it goes full speed at the object. They're both going, heading for each other at full speed. There are only a few seconds until impact. The whole world is watching. This rocket is now the only hope there is to save everyone on Earth. The rocket starts melting before impact. And suddenly, a large shockwave ripples through the sky. The rocket was able to break the large object into many pieces. The problem now is the smaller debris falling onto Earth. But since everyone is in bunkers, they're safe. Adam and his colleagues celebrate. You and the rest of the astronauts are safe and make it safely back to Earth. The next phase for everyone on Earth is to rebuild everything that was destroyed. People will have to start everything from scratch. But this is only the beginning of a new chapter in life.